Hein, can you find a Mark on that list and make him a co-host? Sure. Thanks. Welcome everybody. Uh, we're gonna wait another minute or so just for a few more people to join. Um, but thanks for being with us and we'll kick off in just a minute or two. I'm also gonna mute everyone so that we can just maintain some semblance of, of order on this Zoom call. Alrighty, let's just jump in. Can everyone hear me okay? Give me a thumbs up or something. Sounds good. So uh, welcome to A2 New Tech. This is our second virtual A2 New Tech and um, happy to have you back. So if you were with us the first time, we had a great, um, yeah, great pitches last time and a good transition to virtual. So I wish we could be meeting in person, but we're glad that we can meet this way and uh, should have a good turnout this, uh, this time as we had about 120 or 130 people RSVPD us. We usually get about 50% of that in the actual event. So um, glad you could join us. Um, I'm David Nesbitt. I'm the host of the meetup for the last two years. And I work at the Center for Academic Innovation at University of Michigan, where I manage an ed tech incubator. Um, so to kick us off, I want to get a sense of who's in the audience. Usually we do this with kind of a hand raising, but I'm gonna launch a poll in a second here. Um, so you should see that pop up on your screen. Go ahead and vote in there just for us to get a sense of who is out there. It's always neat to see the makeup of the group every month. Give a couple more seconds for people to vote. Three more seconds. Okay, and I'll share this with you guys. So 22% so of people here are entrepreneurs right now. 19% want to start a venture. Uh, we have one investor and a marketer. No designers this time. That's a bummer. Invite your designer friends next time. Um, some software developers, we have eight in the audience and then nine who identifies other, um, so something else, secret agent or otherwise. Um, but thanks for joining. It's great to see a diverse group again. And so um, I think it's something we see every month as people come for a lot of different reasons. And I think it's one of the things that makes this group really valuable. It's not just one type of person, but people, people in a lot of different types of roles and paths that are coming to the group. So, um, so what is A2 New Tech? If you're not familiar, this is a monthly meetup that gives us an opportunity to connect with the tech community here in Ann Arbor and hear pitches of some of the newest tech ventures that are being developed in the area. Um, so it's a really valuable time to just uh, stay up to date with what's happening in the community here and to meet people, to make connections. Um, and so glad you made it up with us. Hope you'll join us again next month. Um, in the meantime, before our next meetup, which is the third Tuesday of every month, um, before then, if you want to stay connected with people in the tech community in Ann Arbor, um, you can do that through our Slack channel, which is madeina2.com slash Slack. That's madeina2.com slash Slack. Um, so on that is a, that is a Slack team for the tech community in Ann Arbor in general. Um, it's open to join and there, you'll be see things there like general announcements about the tech community um, or from tech folks here, um, open jobs and lots of other kinds of postings. Um, and so I encourage you to check that out, see if it's for you and if it has helpful information. Um, and if you haven't seen madeina2.com, uh, definitely check that out too. It's a, a website that features the different tech companies in Ann Arbor. And so it's a great way to learn about maybe other people that are out there and companies that are out there that you didn't know of. Um, so for the sake of us saving some screen time this time, uh, because uh, don't love a long video call, I wanna keep this brief for you guys. So I'm gonna shorten the usual thank yous. Still wanna say thank you to A2 Geeks, Roger Rail, our co-organizer is the Entrepreneurship Clinic at U of M Law School, who usually gets us our room, although we're doing this on Zoom. Um, so I suppose thank you, Zoom. Um, and Ann Arbor Spark, um, who usually sponsors our post-event networking. Look forward to when we can get back to some post-networking or some post-meetup pizza with you all. Um, given uh, by Spark. I also want to say thank you to Hein Lam, who's here helping me with uh, moderating the attendee list to watch out for spammers. 
uh, we want to make sure to keep this uh, event safe. Um, and so appreciate him helping me out with that. So tonight we're going to keep things going pretty quick. Um, and we're going to go until about 7.30 PM. So this will be shorter than our usual meetup. Tonight we have four companies that are each doing a five minute pitch and a five minute Q&A afterwards. Um, and then after that, we'll have a community announcements time um, where we'll encourage you to put your announcements in the chat. And then um, we're going to put those over and uh, add them on the meetup page as a comment there so everyone can see them, not just people that are on this call. Um, and so think about what that community announcement would be for you, whether it's an event you want to promote or um, someone you know is looking, is, um, looking to hire somebody or looking for a job opportunity or um, you're looking for a collaborator, collaborator anything like that. After announcements, uh, we're going to sort attendees into breakout rooms for some networking time. So last month, this was really popular. People stuck around for like 45 minutes or something in the breakout rooms. It was great to see. Um, and so we'll randomly do that, sort you into rooms, encourage you to stay, stick around and chat with people later in the rooms as it's a great way to um, have some conversation, given that it's hard to do that in this format now and virtually. Those breakout rooms will put you into smaller groups that will let you have some more conversation. So um, stick around if you can. So presenters, um, I'm gonna give a, start a five minute timer for you on my side, but if you wanna grab a timer, a phone or something like that on your side, that would be great too, so that um, you can keep track of time. Uh, I will also type a one minute warning in the chat. So if you can see this um, chat window right here, um, I'll put some kind of a warning like this. And um, if you can see that while you're pitching, you'll be in good shape, you'll see that pop up, you know you have one minute left. Um, and I will kind of gently cut you off if you go over the five minute mark. Um, so try to stick to that. Um, if you have a question you want to ask the pitch, um, the person who's pitching in the Q&A portion after a pitch, please type that into the chat. So you'll put it into the chat right where my message just popped up. And um, I'll go ahead and call out those questions to the presenter so they can answer them for the group verbally. Um, and so all of you are on mute. Um, so I'll read those questions for you. You can just type them in the chat. Um, so last thing I'll say before we jump in, if you use Twitter or Instagram um, or LinkedIn and you're posting about AT New Tech, um, which I'd encourage you to do, you can use the hashtag A2, hashtag A2 New Tech um, to uh, connect to other posts about AT New Tech over time. Alrighty, so with that, we're gonna go to our first pitch tonight. And um, Steven Kadiev is our first pitch. He's pitching Neo H2 which is high efficiency methanol reformer for on-site delivery of clean energy hydrogen. So we're excited, we've wanted to have Neo H2 pitch for a while and it finally worked out this month. Um, so I'm gonna spotlight Steven's video and let him take it away. And just a moment, let me spotlight you and you'll be all set to go. All right, go ahead, Steven. Okay, I and I'll start your timer now. Okay, great, you can hear me? Yes. So I'm the CEO of Neo H2. Uh, the company was incorporated two years ago. The technology has been in development for the last 20 years. Um, we are actually based in South Carolina. Um, it's a clean energy tech startup. That's a picture of our building. Um, the, the, the technology was actually developed in South Africa and then also in Europe. Uh, a couple of years ago, we decided to move it to the US to sort of try and get the uh, best uh, um, bang for buck here in the US with respect to developing the business. Um, what we have is a novel range of catalysts that are used for fuel efficiency and emission control. And one of these proprietary catalysts is used in our um, reformer, which you can see on the bottom, bottom uh, right of the screen. Um, this reformer is a machine that utilizes alcohol-based fuels. Uh, we prefer using methanol for various reasons and the machine will use the methanol and produce a hydrogen rich gas, which can be used on demand. And the primary uh, goal of using this gas is to reduce emissions from internal combustion engines and reduce the fuel consumption of hydrocarbon fuels. Um, our inventors on the right hand side are my aunt and uncle. Both of them have extensive experience with novel uh, clean energy technologies. My aunt was a very high level executive at Anglo-American Corporation in South Africa for a good couple decades and she ran their gold research laboratories. My uncle had an industrial hydraulic press company which he eventually sold. My cousin and I, Lawrence, started the company here in the US a couple years ago and over the last year I've managed to draft both Xiao and Greg all into the company to lead the engineering uh, focus of, of the team and then also uh, help develop the reform and get the technology into the real world. We have managed to find two really key consultants with Colleen Spiegel and Jay Hasty, who are both uh, PhDs and have extensive experience 
in energy in different fields. Uh, Colleen has uh, her experience in hydrogen fuel cells, and then Jay is uh, in, in renewable energy, and her expertise is material science. So the, the problem that we're trying to address is the need for clean energy. We feel that uh, there, the market is really big uh, with respect to uh, internal combustion engines that are located worldwide from land-based gensets, ocean vessels, tugs and barges here in the US and obviously the trucking industry. And there's an ever expanding hydrogen fuel cell market as well as the uh, big push for hydrogen infrastructure projects. So the good news is that methanol is uh, not a well-recognized fuel source, but it is an excellent carrier of hydrogen. And this is a really growing industry. And the, the industry is also evolving in the sense that there's the movement towards renewable methanol, which results in the recirculation of um, carbon, which obviously is really important. So this is our solution at the current time in its current form. We call it the HR100 because it produces 100 liters of hydrogen per minute. We feel that it's best in class based on our test results and what's available with respect to uh, commercial products out there and also what's been documented in the literature. Um, it's much cheaper for us to produce hydrogen kilogram uh, per kilogram compared to our competitors. Down the road, we envision that our economic model will involve uh, utilizing the technology for um, internal combustion engine applications as well as fuel cells. We feel as if we can license this and, and uh, take into account the carbon capture credit technology uh, credits out there. So the machine uses methanol, compressed air, water, and electric powder, sorry, electric power, and out comes a uh, uh, reformate gas with a composition roughly 40% hydrogen. And we produce about half a kilogram of hydrogen per minute. Our investment opportunity um, that we are seeking is to raise a million dollars at uh, 3 million valuation. And this will allow us to have working capital, compile further data, work on select projects to get the, the technology to market. We have our patents ready for filing, but have not done so yet. And we are busy talking to various customers and strategic partners about uh, deploying our technology in, into the real world. Uh, milestones that we would like to achieve is to have our, our product ready for commercialization by the end of the year. Um, and to refine our automation process and to successfully um, achieve uh, um, grant funding. So quick summary for what we offer at the current time. Uh, we feel as if the investor will um, benefit from, our, uh, from investing into our company as we uh, have uh, an exciting technology that uh, um, can generate a, a large amount of capital. We are ready to go to market in the next six to 12 months. Um, to the customer can help with internal combustion engine uh, uh, and uh, combustion enhancement. And it will be an, a system that can be easily adopted into these engines. And we can also uh, use our engine with fuel cell technology as well. And if it's used in with internal combustion engines, there'll be a massive savings with respect to using diesel as the primary fuel. And for the environment, there'll be a large reduction in CO2 and unwanted emissions, which is obviously at the forefront of everyone who really cares about the environment. Um, with respect to the real world, uh, our target applications are gen sets, diesel and gas uh, engines, both on land based and marine, uh, high temperature uh, fuel cells and solid oxide fuel cells. And we've started talking to customers and trade organizations with respect to getting our technology out there into the world and have made some solid strides into that uh, recently. So this is our facility in South Carolina. And there is extensive literature out there with respect to what uh, can be achieved with hydrogen combustion enhancement. So we're very excited about our technology and what, it can, uh, what, what we can achieve with respect to the decarbonization effort. That's all the time we got for the pitch. Thanks so much, Stephen. Pleasure. So uh, usually we'd give a round of applause. If you guys wanna hit the emoji uh, applause button, feel free or give some thumbs up at this point. Uh, but at this point, I'll open up for some questions for Stephen. Um, you can type them right into the chat. And so I'll give you a minute or two to think about those. Um, and uh, then I'll call those up for Stephen as we go. So go ahead and type your questions into the chat window. See, we've got some applause emojis there. That's great. Um, and perhaps I'll ask a question to kick us off. Stephen, what do you see as the biggest barrier right now to the company's success in terms of the biggest challenge that keeps you up at night? Well, as any startup, you know, money is always a, uh, is a concern. And, uh, you know, we, we've uh, been aggressively trying to raise funds over the last year. We've got a couple of solid leads. Um, 
Uh, so that's probably my biggest headache right now. Um, I think we've created a very solid team. So that was something that was concerning over the last, you know, towards the end of 2019, I did not have that. And now I feel I've got a very solid group of engineers that we are working with. Um, we've just joined the Methanol Institute and they will uh, foster a lot of leverage for us in terms of um, getting our product uh, out there in the world in terms of, uh, you know, the methanol industry. So we're very excited about that. Um, you know, and uh, oh, I forgot to mention, we, um, you know, are seeking National Science Foundation uh, grant funding. We had a preliminary pr proposal just accepted and have to submit the full proposal for an SBIR grant, which will hopefully be due in next, submit in the next couple of weeks. So lots of excitement on our end. That's great. Thank you. Um, we've got some questions that come in. Um, one question is, can you compare methanol to natural gas as a source of hydrogen? Yeah, so uh, we feel that using methanol is actually cleaner than natural gas. Um, obviously, natural gas has methane, but has other gases in there and some long chain hydrocarbons. So from our perspective, it's a, it's a cleaner uh, source and methanol is obviously very cheap and it's one of the cheapest fuel sources out there. And it's a wonderful carrier of, of hydrogen. And uh, we have the one thing we didn't mention in the presentation is that uh, you know, the ability for, of our machine to convert hydrogen in, in sorry, methanol to hydrogen is you know, far superior than anyone else out there. And uh, um, the one wonderful thing about methanol, it's a one carbon chain molecule, even compared to, to ethanol. So the carbon footprint is really minimal with respect to using methanol. And if you're using renewable methanol, it's a carbon neutral system. Great. Um, someone asks, how does your solution compare with companies like Plug Power and Ballard? So I guess Plug Power, uh, they use um, fuel cell technology with uh, compressed pure hydrogen into their PEM cells. Um, so, uh, you know, they, they would be a potential target for us in terms of a customer if we uh, um, uh, can configure our system to uh, supply the gas to uh, regular PEM cells. But um, they're not really um, a, a competitor. They, they use different technology. There, there's so much landscape out there with respect to hydrogen technologies in terms of where you can use the, the uh, um, our technology. And we, we certainly feel that there's an untapped market with respect to combustion enhancement for these large land-based gensets, which may not be used as much here in the US or North America, but certainly worldwide. There are a tremendous amount of, of gensets that use um, diesel fuel as primer or continuous power. Um, Ballard, obviously, they're a fuel cell company, and we potentially would, would like to partner with such companies where we can use their technology as a conduit to uh, uh, release the energy from our gas. So, yeah, we've been reaching out to various companies to work with them, specifically companies that have solid oxide fuel cells that would be able to use, um, you know, our, our gas blend. Thanks, Stephen. Um, last question we have here is, uh, besides money, what else does your company need right now? No, I think support, recognition, getting the the, uh, um, the, the technology out there, um, forming those strategic partners with respect to people who uh, uh, utilize hydrogen. Um, I think hydrogen in this country is not at the forefront of what people think as a uh, as a uh, energy source. I think that's coming. If you look at Europe and Asia, you know they're well ahead of us with respect to that, and I think. If, if people share the message of, of using hydrogen, uh, I think it will really help us uh, get to where we want to get one day. And I think that's a real, really exciting thing. I can answer that. Thanks. That's question. great. Well, thanks again, Stephen, for the pitch. Go ahead. Oh, no, just the one question is about the safety concerns about using methanol. Uh, yeah. Every fuel has safety concerns. Um, one of the, the big things with methanol is, you know, education and understanding how to handle it safely. Um, it's been around for a very long time. Uh, the Methanol Institute obviously um, is a trade organization that helps educate and, and uh, make it apparent that methanol is a very safe fuel. And from, from the perspective of comparing methanol to diesel and what it can do to the environment, methanol is, is much safer with respect to the environmental risk associated with using this fuel. Um, and, you know, we've been operating with methanol in our factory for two years now and haven't had one incident. Uh, obviously hope to keep it that way. Right. Awesome. Thanks. Well, that's all the time we got for questions. If you have more questions for Stephen, hopefully you can stick around afterwards in the breakout rooms and um, you can connect with him there. But um, I'm going to now uh, invite our next presenter, David Franco. David is presenting Exceptional Academy. 
Um, the Exceptional Academy provides IT training to local adults with disabilities that results in globally recognized technology certifications up to and including CCNA, which is the Cisco Certified Network Associate with a focus on cybersecurity. So I'm gonna spotlight David's video so he can present and then David, you can um, start whenever you'd like and I'll start your timer for you. Sure thing. Okay, should I, should I share my screen? Yeah, you can share your screen now, that'd be great. Looks great. Okay, well, David, thanks for uh, this opportunity. Um, so as David was saying, my name is David Franco. I'm the Director of Business Development for the Living and Learning Enrichment Center. Um, we are a nonprofit in uh, Northville that uh, provides, um, we help uh, teens and adults with uh, autism and related challenges with development of their social work and independent living skills. And I oversee a program within this nonprofit called the Exceptional Academy. And um, basically what the Exceptional Academy is, um, we're, we're training people with disabilities, not just people with autism, but any type of disability throughout the Metro Detroit area um, on a Cisco certification, the CCNA specifically. And it's a joint effort between the Living and Learning Enrichment Center uh, the Cisco Networking Academy, which provides the curriculum, um, Michigan Rehabilitation Services, which is a, a state office um, that helps people with disabilities get long-term jobs, uh, Michigan Career and Technical Institute, which is um, MRS's uh, post-secondary learning institute on the uh, western part of the state. It's kind of like a, a vocational center uh, for people with disabilities. And we're doing all this under the guidance of uh, Patrick Bromzek, who is a retired Cisco executive and who launched a similar program when he was an executive at Cisco. Um, he did this very successfully. It's a program that's still going on at Cisco, even though um, he's retired. Uh, he's since launched this program in the city of New York. So it's, it's a proven program. And he's from Northville, so his goal was to, to get it launched locally here in, in uh, the Detroit area. And we just happened to meet with them, and that's just how we got the ball rolling. I have a background in IT uh, or technology sales, and so this was something that just fit right in with what I wanted to do. Um, so in addition to providing um, this technology training to our, our students, um, it's kind of a multifaceted approach. We're also partnering with local corporations like Comerica, Flagstar Bank, Plant Moran, and Masco. Um, they're providing uh, not just financial support, but also internship opportunities. So once the classroom phase for this program is done, they'll, our students will be getting a two to three month internship with these companies. Lear is another company that's uh, on board to provide uh, an internship opportunity. Uh, they haven't supported us financially yet, but um, they, they are going to provide internships. Um, the ultimate goal, of course, is to get all of our students long-term jobs. Um, I, I, I should note that um, all of our students um, either were not working before they started this academy, or if they were working, they were in um, like part-time uh, minimum wage jobs. Uh, one of our, you know, um, janitors, one guy was working at Del Taco, and these are the types of jobs that they've had, they would have the rest of their lives if they weren't involved in a program like this. So we're trying to um, get them the, the training that they need, training that is or needed by local corporations. Um, companies are struggling to find this kind of talent. So we're, we're providing the talent that they need and uh, hopefully getting our students long-term jobs. Um, oh. So the way you can help is obviously we're a nonprofit. Um, like the previous uh, presenter was saying, cash is uh, obviously always needed. So we are looking for financial sponsors. Uh, one of the things we wanna do is obviously expansion. Uh, we want to do this geographically. So right now we're basing the, the uh, 
the class out of Livonia, Madonna University. Uh, we want to set up another facility or another classroom in Detroit, for example. Um, so we want to expand geographically and we also want to expand the curriculum. Um, so right now we're focused on the CCNA. We'd like to add like a, a CompTIA type of certification, an A+, something lower level um, for the students who can't get through such a rigorous uh, um, certification like the CCNA. Uh, we want to get build our own lab right now we're using the lab once a week from uh, washington community college in ann arbor um, so we we're looking for companies to donate equipment we need cisco equipment um, equipment for the comptia a plus certification uh, we're looking for internship and employment opportunities um, potential students if you know somebody with a disability um, who you think uh, has a strong interest in technology or is good in math. Um, those are good people for this type of opportunity. Um, and companies willing to provide training. We, we do more than just the technology training. We also do um, general work skills training, job readiness, soft skills. Uh, Plant Moran, for example, just did some training on resume writing. They provided mock interviews. Um, so the companies that are, are sponsoring us and are involved, um, they're, they're doing way more than we had ever hoped they would. Um, all so right, that, that is all the time we've got. I hate to cut you off. No, no, that's fine. That's, that's pretty much it. Okay, excellent. So if we have any other things, uh, maybe other things that you want to share, people may ask them the questions and bring that out. Um, so thanks so much, David, for the, the pitch. Uh, we can see some applause emojis out there. And thanks for sharing about Exceptional Academy. We already have one question that came in, which is how long is the training and what's the placement rate? So this is the first year we're doing it. So we don't have numbers on placement, um, but we, we start with, uh, we keep the, the classes small. There's 15 students that we, we made offers to. We had 14 that accepted, one person denied, unfortunately. She's actually coming back for this, this next cohort. Um, but the classes are a typical school year. They, they run from September through June, July. It's a 40 week program. Um, we stretched out the, uh, um, the length of the program. A lot of, you know, most people can get through this in I don't know, three to six months. Uh, we're doing it in 40 weeks. Uh, but that's part of the accommodation that we bring to, to the students. Um, what was the other question? Someone asked, um... How many students have you trained so far? And okay, if you have so, other yeah, questions, guys, feel free to type them into the chat for, uh, for David. Placement. But, yeah, so we, we started off with 14 students. Uh, we have 11 that are left and we're in our final uh, quarter. So um, our, our instructor who did this, he came from Washtenaw Community College. He, he's been a, a cybersecurity instructor for uh, 20 years. Um, he said that even at WCC, they have students drop out of this class throughout the year. It's, it's not for everybody. Um, he says that our retention numbers so far are in line or ahead of anything he's seen at WCC. He's also said that uh, this is one of his favorite classes because the students actually want to learn. They come to class engaged and ready to go. It's pretty exciting. That's great. Someone else asked, how intensive is the program? Can students work a job while completing it? It, it is intensive. Um, you know, CCNA isn't a, a, a very easy certification. Um, I consider it more like a mid-range. The CompTIA A plus is more of an, an entry level. Um, so it is difficult. Uh, it's difficult for a person without a disability. So we, I mean, we have students who have, have attempted to work. It's, it's not something that I, I think would be good for a student. I, I think that their focus needs to be on on this, if they're going to try to go through this type of academy. Great, someone else asked, uh, how much does it cost from sponsors or people want to help for a student? So essentially, what's the cost of a student going through the program? So as long as they're able to register through the state, um, it's free to the student. There's no charge. The academy, the placement, the certification, everything's free. It's covered by partners and sponsors. Excellent. What other questions do we have for David? We've got another minute for questions. Um, so the question is, what is the cost for Exceptional Academy to train a student? 
Well, I mean, we've got to pay the, so our, our approach is that, well, first of all, we're, we're renting a class. We right. are renting the, the equipment. We, um, we have an instructor that we have to pay. We have also the thing that makes this work is we have a, a teacher's assistant. He's kind of like a second instructor because he has to learn the different learning styles of each individual student and reinforce the content with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis or, or a small group basis. Um, so th those are the main, the main expenditures that we have. But uh, like I said, we're trying to expand, we're trying to buy equipment to build our own, our own lab. Um, so there's, there's a lot involved. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, David, for the pitch. Um, it's great to hear about Exceptional Academy and what you guys are working on. Um, if you have more questions for David, feel free to connect with him in the breakouts afterwards. Um, but we're going to move on to our next pitch and keep things rolling here. Our next pitch is Project Thanks. Chatcast, and that's um, Anthony Montalbano. Um, and so I'm going to, let's see, spotlight his video here. So Project Chatcast is a communication tool for multi-unit franchise restaurants. Um, and so in a moment, Anthony's going to tell you all about it. But um, fun fact before he starts that, that he and his co-founder, before they started Amber Detroit, um, the company he works at now, um, helped lead the charge for the UI and UX and the development of Domino's.com 2010. And this included a completely new reordering experience, much of which hasn't changed still today. So probably a lot of us have used it. So I'll hand it over to uh, Anthony to give us the pitch about Project Checkcast. I appreciate it. Can you guys all see my screen okay? Yes. All right. Excellent. Okay, so let's uh, let's jump into this um, project check. Yeah. So this is a, a really new project for us, but we're we're really excited about what we're doing. Um, so before I jump right into what project checkcast is, uh, I thought let's start with talking about a problem. So um, we're going to put ourselves in the shoes of essentially uh, someone at I'm using Domino's as the example here, uh, but someone at corporate, maybe HR or um, PR, that wants to send out a message to their employees. Um, in a timely instance of today, um, being able to send information out uh, in regards to COVID uh, can be somewhat difficult um, considering the amount of channels that they often have to go through. So if Domino's were to send, have to send a message out, uh, corporate might communicate to their franchisee owners who then have to communicate to store managers who then have to communicate with their in-store employees. So if you can see here, um, and this is pretty common, there, there's actually even often even more chain, like to the chain in this, but uh, for the sake of this example, we'll just go with this. Uh, but we have like a, a telephone game going on here and uh, often the messages can get, be somewhat lost when they're trying to make sure that there's really important, important information to be sent out. And so the way it's often done now is uh, emails are sent out, there's phone calls, they have meetings, they actually have cork boards inside of many of these um, quick service restaurants that would have these type of alert type messages. But often this isn't enough and often the messages are somewhat lost. So what if there was a way that someone from let's say the corporate level could have a better communication directly to their in-store employees? And that's essentially what we are seeking to solve. Um, and so our mission here is to provide a direct visible communication channel between stakeholders and employees in the field. So that's how we look at that. So how do we do this? So I think that the best way to do this is just show you a few things. Um, we have uh, a communicator app. Uh, it's an app that someone at uh, corporate could have, a franchisee could have, uh, even a store manager could have so that they can send out communication. Uh, and then we have a command center, which is a, a screen that would go on the wall somewhere um, in the back office of a restaurant. And so uh, the easiest way to do this is just look at a simple example. Um, so we have the app. Uh, let's say the store manager wants to send a message to the team. Uh, they would log into the app. They would select their company. Uh, sometimes a, a store manager or franchisee owner might have more than one company that they're working with. If not, there. Uh, but they would select the location. And then once they select their location, they could select an action bot. Uh, so in this instance, let's say they want to send the alert. So we would select the alert. You would actually interact with a, a bot on your phone. So it'd be a very uh, seamless user experience here in terms of sending some information together. And then once you've sent the proper information, uh, the alert, it would say that the alert is published. Uh, and then if you go back to the command center, uh, it would look something like this where a message would show up on the screen so that everybody would be able to see it. So 
that is our really short uh, example of how this works, but there's a little bit more to that, actually a lot more. Uh, so let's take a little bit deeper step into what this command center can actually do inside of a restaurant. Uh, so we have uh, a screen like this. And so uh, let's say, go back to here for a second. And if you were to dismiss this alert screen, um, it would go to our what we call our dashboard mode or screensaver mode. And you'll understand why we call it screensaver in a moment. So you would see a screen like this. This is dynamically updating. It's something that any employee would be able to see promos, who's working today, the weather, and some other things. These are all customizable widgets per location. Um, but what gets really interesting is when you actually go into what we call interactive or swipe mode. So if you do swipe, you'll get into this. And when I say swipe, uh, it's actually a hand-free gesture. And this is really a unique approach to how you interact with something because we understand, uh, especially today in, in a COVID environment and post-COVID environment, uh, the need for good hygiene. And so with hands-free, we can not only be ultra clean, it's a natural interaction experience. Um, it doesn't require any additional uh, user requirements, meaning they don't have to have a controller or anything in their hands. Um, it's just using your hand as the form of input. So let's just go back to the screen for an example. Um, and let's just pretend that we're swiping down here. So you can kind of see my hand on the right. And I'm just swiping down. And you'll actually be able to see different elements on this interactive screen and get more information beyond what you would see on that dashboard. So if you go into video, you can watch a video. Again, hand motions are very seamless in this experience. Um, we can get into the video again. We can swipe left and right to move into things or out of things. So here's the video. Let's say this video finishes playing similar to a screensaver, some time goes by and it goes back to your dashboard mode. So it's a pretty simple experience here, but it's really powerful being able to communicate information to uh, the employees all the way from the corporate to franchisee level to store managers and so forth. So uh, the next logical question would say, well, why us um, and who is this? So Amber Detroit, uh, the short thing is, is uh, we're a team of developers and designers based in Detroit. Uh, we have eight years of in business. Um, we actually have clients in the multi-unit franchisee experience. Um, we've built software for millions of people and you can see some of our, our clients here. So we have a, a pretty good experience building software and we're really excited to get this out there. So where do we go from here? We have uh, the app and the, the command center, which is currently in development now. Um, but there's a lot more that we have. We're, we can continue development. We're looking for partners that want to beta test the system. We want to become exhibitors. And we're also looking for investors to help us grow this faster. So with that, I'm going to lead with uh, questions. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Thanks, Anthony. Um, great pitch. Really interesting to hear about that. So what questions do we have for Anthony? Go ahead and type them into the chat. So first question, what are you primarily selling? The physical command center, the software, or, or what? Yeah, so what we're selling actually is primarily the software. So it is a cloud-based system. Um, there is a, obviously a mobile app that is part of the software. Um, there is some hardware components primarily around the gesture-based things. Uh, the way we see this and the way this would work is um, there would be a screen that would be purchased by a franchisee owner or a corporate store that they would put into their stores. Um, and then they would attach essentially an HDMI PC that would have um, a gesture-based control built into it. So uh, we would provide that piece of the hardware, but they would be they would make their decision on the size screen that they want, whether it's a 40 inch or 30 inch or stuff like that. Uh, next question, how will you price it? Uh, the way we're, we're planning on pricing, and we're actually working with a few of our clients that uh, directly, like I mentioned, we do have some franchise uh, clients that we're working with in, in tandem with this project. Um, but what we are looking is a per, uh, board so like right now like this example is one board it's a per board annual cost um, that would give you a lot of functionality there and then we're going to have um, some additional add-ons that we plan on adding um, so that if you want to do additional customizations on top of it for your stores um, that will be additional costs someone else asked do you exclusively exclusively use hand motions to control things within the apps not within the app so the the app is just going to be a very much a, a uh, an app that you would use touch and, and control. Uh, the thought is to be very um, user experience like native, meaning that you're familiar with uh, chat type spots. Um, so we wanna be able to do stuff like that where the, the app itself on the phone is just gonna work like any other app, you touch things and stuff like that. The, the only thing that's really gesture-based controlled is the, uh, what shows in the stores for the, that hygiene reason that I mentioned. Someone else asked what type of security do you use? 
Um, so uh, I guess that's a really broad question. Um, but a lot of the, I guess I, I don't have a direct answer for that. It's probably the best way to answer that because I don't know specifically what they're asking. Um, I don't know if Robert, if you want to provide more information on what you're looking at. Um, but if I, if I were to answer that without any more details, I would say from a security standpoint, uh, the platform is supposed to, is going to be all web based. Um, so we would actually have some uh, APIs that are going to be all controlled, uh, permission based controlled um, down from the mobile app all the way through to the uh, um, the interface thing that talks to the HDMI dongle. Someone else asked, how much money do you need to raise? That is a great question. And we have not solved that problem yet. Um, for our for our sake, uh, again, this is something that has come up relatively recent. Uh, we've been working on this um, for really just a little over a month now. So this is, again, super new. Um, I would say, like, we're still trying to strategize what type of funding that we need. Um, we are also looking at our franchisee partners to try to figure out what type of cost it will take because um, they're also potentially uh, going to help out with that as well. But I wish I had a better <laughs> answer in terms of cost. Um, but I would love to talk to people about, about that. Sure thing. And then last question, we've got time for one, maybe two more. Who do you see as your competitors? Ask MJ. Yeah, so that's a, that's a really good question in terms of competitors. Um, for our sake, uh, we haven't seen anything quite like this in terms of the communication. Um, we are very familiar with a lot of the BI uh, dashboard tools that are out there, and there is some resemblance to that. But I think what really kind of sets this apart from maybe some of the BI dashboard tools is the fact that there is um, some interactivity mode that doesn't exist. But the part that also gives a lot of value is the fact that we have this like permission-based control communication channels where you can actually send information to it. It's a lot more than just showing. You know, while we do have some options for BI information, um, the communication is really what is setting us apart. Uh, we did dig and try to find something specific to this, as well as our clients who had approached us with this. Um, and they weren't able to find anything quite like this. Uh, we are familiar with a lot of the digital signage tools that are out there as well, like I said, the BI tools, um, but nothing that kind of combines the two to create the experience that we've created. So if you know of the competitors, we would love to see what other people are doing because, you know, in our initial research, we haven't found anything specific uh, that matches the needs that we've been building. Um, but we know that there's totally possibilities that it's out there. But awesome. we'll make it well, better, of course. Yeah, that's all the time we got. Thanks so much, Anthony. Um, for, thank, appreciate the pitch and answering the questions. Um, great to hear about what you're working on. Um, so if again, if you have more questions for Anthony, you want to talk more about this, I know there's at least one more in the chat. Feel free to stick around afterwards for the breakouts, but hit that applause button under reactions. Let them know you appreciated it. And we're going to go on to our last pitch, um, which is Mark Enstead. So uh, Mark was uh, pitched last year at A2 New Tech um, and under the name Hydro Labs, they've rebranded as Numio. Um, and so he's going to tell us about Numio, but they, uh, Numio does identity linked solutions to power DeFi. So I'll hand it over to Mark. Let me spotlight your video and I'll start your timer on my side, Mark, and I'll give you a one minute warning. All righty. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Can you hear you great? All righty. Let me get rolling on this then. All right. Can you see my screen? Yes. You're all set. Awesome. Well, thank you guys uh, for giving me the opportunity to come and speak, I guess, a, a second time. Uh, give you guys a little bit of an update as to where we're at in terms of development. Um, but as he's mentioned, uh, my name is Mark Anstead. I'm one of the co-founders of Numio and pumped to talk to you guys about uh, a little bit what we are building. Uh, so we are building out uh, a couple products right now to help service this awesome and incredible growing world uh, that is known as DeFi, which is a term known for decentralized finance on top of Ethereum. And the products that we were developing, they work uh, hand in hand, not only with a lot of the IP that we've developed in house, but also different types of open source uh, protocols and technology within our products that are focused on three things, which are payments, asset management, and digital identity management. And those are built into our two core products, which are Numio Pay and Numio Vault. So for those of you who aren't familiar with DeFi, it's, it's quite a new term. It's essentially creating a financial ecosystem or system that minimizes the amount of centralized authorities that have to oversee it or participate within it. 
And there are five main things that we are actually doing to help bolster or even strengthen uh, this world of DeFi. And those are scalability, onboarding, volatility, security, and education. When it comes to scalability, we've been working with the Amisego network team and building in a plasma chain into our products that enables for about 3,000 transactions per second. When it comes to onboarding, every single user who's onboarded receives their own unique digital identity. And when it comes to volatility, our main focus isn't necessarily on Bitcoin or Ethereum. Our focus is more so actually on stable coins. And when it comes to security, we've built out some awesome IP, uh, which is called Numio Cloud, that allows people to store basically any type of file, data, or information into a zero-knowledge proof that allows you to protect and recover accounts uh, extremely securely. When it comes to education, our users, they, they really don't actually have to know that they're using a blockchain product because we're making it easy to use. And now for the products, the actual fun stuff. Numio Pay, this is our product that we released uh, in the middle of last year, and it enables for peer-to-peer -peer and point-of-sale transactions. It was actually the first product operating on Ethereum, enabling for gasless transactions between identities. And what that means is you don't need Ethereum in a non-custodial wallet to interact uh, with the Ethereum network, or in this case, uh, facilitate a transaction, which is awesome. We also enable for instant transactions as a part of our um, implementation with the Plasma chain, and also enable for instant, rem or, I'm sorry, low fee remittances between a bunch of different types of um, corridors. And as I've mentioned previously, every single user that is onboarded is able to receive their own unique DeFi ID, which is their digital identity. And as a part of that, we enable for identity management. So all of these documents that you're uploading, whether it's your passport, driver's license, um, your social security number, any of this information is all able to be stored securely within our Numio cloud, which has no backdoor access whatsoever. No one else has access to that information. No one else in this call or meeting would have access to it. Only you do. It also enables for instant onboarding because you're essentially creating a universal or um, a universal KYC solution. And most importantly, we're protecting user identities and their mobile data because, I mean, we're seeing constantly everyone is having different types of uh, document leaks or just hacks in general, and we've built out a solution that helps prevent that. And Numio Vault, this is our product that we are currently in QA on right now and we'll be releasing it in the next couple weeks. It is the first wallet enabling for blockchain-based 2FA security. It also enables for keyless security as a part of our implementation with Numio Cloud. And what that means is when you're being onboarded, you don't actually need to write down or interact with a private key. You are the private key. Your identity is your private key. We also enable for lending and borrowing as well as fiat on and off ramps or even trading between different types of assets through decks. We also introduce different types of premium features like multi-sig, dead man switch, rate limiters, whitelisting of addresses, and a bunch of others. And this is our core team. Uh, we have Marco, myself, Jason, and Tim. And that's it. That's also my picture pre-quarantine. Uh, believe it or not, and look forward to some of your questions and a little bit about what we're building and pilots, you name it. Hit me with your questions. Thank All you. right. Th thanks, Mark. This is, uh, this is great to hear an update about what you guys have been working on. So first question is, who is the target end user? Is it criminals? <laughs> <laughs> um, no. So we have, we have two pilots that we're currently working on. We have, we have two avenues for, for monetization. One is B2B to C, and the latter is B2B, uh, mainly just because of a lot of organic demand that we have received. Uh, so our, our first pilot that we are currently working on right now is for point of sale payments here in the United States. And we've been working with uh, some dispensaries down in Florida uh, because, uh, as many people might know, uh, the banking situation with uh, cannabis is absolutely horrid. 
And we have built out a white labeled solution of uh, Numio Pay, which will be known as HydroPay, that enables for any type of merchant to accept both debit and credit cards, uh, whether it's in store or online, in a legal and compliant manner. So in that route, uh, we would actually be selling to different types of merchants, in this case, a dispensary, uh, who will then be offering it as a payment solution for their customers. Uh, we've been working with a dispensary who has about uh, 30 locations down in Florida, um, as well as speaking to various ERP systems, uh, one of which is here in Michigan, another is focused out on the West Coast, in California, Oregon, and Washington, uh, who are looking to introduce uh, our products to basically all of their, uh, I guess, clients. Um, so an ERP system is an enterprise resource planner, and uh, many of whom work with different types of dispensaries and even offer them e-wallets. And some of them are able to offer uh, debit card payments, which is essentially just the same as going into a store and basically doing a, an ATM withdrawal. And uh, we've essentially built out a solution that removes the requirement for any cash whatsoever and allows them to do that entirely digitally. And then we've also uh, established a relationship out in Nigeria uh, where we have not only gotten an enterprise who wants to license basically everything that we're building uh, to introduce to all of their merchants, uh, but we've also uh, created a relationship with a Nigerian bank, which will introduce the first uh, stable coin around the Nigerian Naira, which is the local currency in Nigeria, uh, to be the first stable coin operating on Ethereum. So that allows for people to interact digitally uh, with one another, whether it's like through peer-to-peer -peer payments or point-of-sale payments. Awesome, thanks for the answer. Um, another question, how do you support gasless transactions? Michelle Gosi asks. Sure, so a gasless transaction, uh, I guess on a simple level, it is enabling for an end user to not have to interact with the Ethereum network. Uh, they don't have to know that that's actually occurring. So when you're interacting with things like uh, my Ether wallet, uh, MetaMask, those are all directly interacting uh, with the Web3, otherwise known as Ethereum. And we've built out uh, some implementations that utilize something called a meta transaction, where you're able to build a relayer API that allows for an end user, uh, when they're going and interacting with a product, let's say they're making a transaction, the transaction would uh, send a message to the relayer API, and the relayer API would then facilitate that transaction. So in essence, rather than a user having to hold multiple assets to interact with one another, they only have to hold one asset. Uh, so our main focus is in and around stable coins, uh, whether it's like USDC, uh, MakerDAO's DAI, or even the Nigerian Naira stable coin that we'll be releasing uh, later this year. They only have to hold that native asset to interact uh, within this greater ecosystem. Okay, someone else asked, can users view transactions as debits and credits? Um, I don't believe so. Um, in, in terms of how these transactions operate, they would be quite similar to a debit card, um, mainly because you can just go, you have an asset in your wallet, and you're able to facilitate a transaction. Uh, you are able to interact in a sense uh, around credit, uh, where you're able to access uh, borrowing uh, through different types of protocols like BZX, Compound, uh, DYDX, uh, where you're actually creating on-chain credit. And when I refer, refer to on-chain, that means on a blockchain. Uh, so that means that you can place collateral. Uh, so the way that those protocols work, you place 75% uh, of what you're looking to borrow and you're able to receive that full amount and you essentially pay back interest on that, uh, I guess, uh, principle that you borrowed. And in that sense, you can create uh, credit, but not in, I, I guess, the traditional sense. We are looking to enable people to build reputation 
uh, around their digital identities to be able to interact with traditional finance, uh, specifically people who are underserved or underbanked, uh, or unbanked, I should say, uh, because they have no way of building any credit. And with how a blockchain system operates, you're able to bring people who have little to no money or even vast amounts of capital to be able to interact within an ecosystem and be able to build up their reputation or in essence, their, their credit. Awesome, thanks, Well, I know we have a couple more questions about this in the chat. I'll leave those for the breakout rooms. Um, so if you want to be put in a room with Mark, I'm happy to do that. Just send me a chat and I'll put you in there. Um, but we're going to wrap up the pitches now. Thanks a ton for those, um, for that pitch. And again, great to hear what you've been uh, pitching about. If you're in the audience and you pitched before at A2 New Tech and you want to give an update like Mark did about uh, where the company's at, we would love to have you do that. So reach back out and I'd love to hear kind of the updates on what happened with the company since you last pitched. Alrighty, so let's, I'm going to spotlight myself here in a second or unspot like this. There we go. So um, we're going to do some community announcement time right now. What I'm actually going to do for community announcements is I'll have you put those in the chat window. Um, and so if you have a meetup to promote or a position you're hiring for or you're looking for a collaborator, a co-founder, etc., cetera, um, you can type that announcement um, into the chat window and include your contact info. Uh, we won't unmute everyone since that's going to be a little bit chaotic uh, to have you do your um, answers, um, to have you do your announcements there. So type them in the chat window. We'll put them as a comment on the Meetup page so that more people get to see that and just are in this chat window. Um, and so we'll, we'll make sure those get transitioned over there. Um, the, uh, so what I'll do is um, I'm going to open the breakout rooms in just a moment after we finish some kind of wrap up announcements. Um, but uh, I will leave, um, if you want to leave an announcement in here, you can stay in the, the main room, type your announcement before you enter into a breakout room, or you can come back and use the leave breakout room or go back to main room button to come back and write your announcement at any time. So if anyone's confused about that, just send me a message um, and make that easier. We'll put it in the chat for you. So um, go ahead and be adding in your announcements now, um, add those into the chat and I see some people doing that already. Make sure to include your um, contact information there so people can access that. So, um, and let me just mute everyone really quick just to make sure. Okay. Um, so last couple of announcements before we wrap up and go to breakout rooms. A2 New Tech is always on the third Tuesday of every month. And so our next A2 New Tech meetup is gonna be Tuesday, June 16th. So mark it on your calendar now. You can go RSVP now on the meetup.com site. Um, we do have spaces left for pitches in June. Uh, we've got plenty of spaces. So if you're interested in pitching, we'd love to have you do it. If you saw this and thought, I can do that, um, or you've got something you'd like to pitch and present, uh, reach out to us and uh, we'd be happy to learn a little bit more about your business and let you know if we can get you in. Um, if you do want to pitch or you want know someone else who should, you should email us at organizers at a2newtech.org and that's how we'll get you connected um, and we'll ask you some questions and learn a little bit more about your um, company. Um, general criteria we look for in terms of who we have pitch is that you've done some customer validation. You know, really that there's a idea that, you know, there's a need for your product because you talk to customers and you know about what they need. Um, and that you've spoken with, with some prospective customers is definitely an important criteria. Hopefully you've also built a prototype uh, of what you're interested in and in building. So you have something to show. So that's it. I'm going to wrap up here. Thanks for joining tonight. This was great. I appreciate each of you making time to be here. Um, we had about 60 people on the call, which is really neat to see. Um, so I'm going to now randomly sort you into breakout rooms so you can do some networking. Stick around if you want to be part of that. I had a few, already had a few people message me and ask uh, if they can be in certain groups with certain uh, presenters. So uh, feel free to chat with me um, if you do want me to put you in a particular room, and I'll do that. But thanks for joining, everybody. You should get a notification on your screen in a moment that um, to have you join a breakout room. And those are open now. So you should see that pop up now and you can join the room you've been invited to.